name a country and I can name an Arctic bird that has come from there. I truly can. We have buff-breasted sandpipers from South America. We have red-necked phalaropes from the open ocean. We have Dunlin from Asia. We have bar-tailed godwits from Australia. This is just the tip of the iceberg. The Arctic is a very remote place for these birds, relatively free of predators, and so they come and rent the Arctic for just a couple of months a year. They have this beautiful breeding plumage, they have songs as dramatic displays. I had seen these birds from around the world, but had no idea of their dynamic lives. And to get those young out in a short amount of time, try and avoid predation, that is a profound experience. I'm Steve Zack, I work with the North America program of the Wildlife Conservation Society. It is true that birds can fly, and so they don't have the same kind of impediments as fences or highways. A long-distance migrating bird has reliable places that it needs as stopovers to fuel up for subsequent migration. Recently, we've had banded birds return, and so it's like seeing friends that we know individually return, come and go from around the world. I migrate to the Arctic like the birds do. Uh, I do it, of course, on a jet plane. I fly up and back from Oregon. We go up there literally when the birds start arriving, and this is toward the end of May. And uh, the breeding season is most of June. That's where we do most of our field work. We monitor that. We look at who the nest predators are. We get the density of birds. We get a lot of information about that breeding season. Did they successfully rear young? or did they lose that nest to a predator? And if they lost that nest to a predator, what is that predator species? Is that predator species that's one that's particularly tied to the oil fields? Energy development has the capacity to attract certain kinds of predators in higher numbers. That is, fox, raven, and gulls tend to be in higher numbers in the oil fields, and they are all nest predators and thus can affect the birds nesting in this far north. We need to know the fate of a nest. That really requires close monitoring of a lot of nests. We find most of them by the bird's behavior. That is a female that scurries off a nest and then we will sit down, go back a bit, watch with binoculars and she will cautiously return and that's how we find nests. But there are some nests that we literally find by putting our foot almost on that nest and a close uh, adhering female jumps off right in front of us. And when it's a big bird like a ptarmigan, there's a quite an adrenaline rush. Uh, unsubtle mothers like Arctic terns, which will come at about 20 miles an hour and fly and bop you right on the head with their uh, talons. Uh, there are other birds will do these distraction displays like you see killdeer do where they pretend that their wings are broken trying to lure you, lure you away from the nest. But we know the code, we know how to find nests when they do that. We're really in literally the most remote part of North America, distant from roads, distant from villages. And I can see this tremendous opportunity, particularly in Western Arctic Alaska, for protection of really large landscapes with really important wildlife. The Arctic is a changing place. It's changing because energy development is set to expand dramatically up there and the very nature of it being remote is under threat. So there are times that I feel that here we are in the United States, in the biggest public landscape in the United States, and we're working there at a time when the conservation future of that place is being decided and we have a participatory role. To me, that's very gratifying, exciting, and even a little bit daunting.